Oh, good morning. All right, try it one more time. Wake me up a little bit. Good morning. All right, great to see y'all. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here at Community Bible Church. We're thrilled to have you here with us. If you did not get a bulletin, make sure you grab a bulletin this morning. There's a lot of information in there about things going on, uh, things coming up. Also on the bulletin is this little thing called the Connect Card, and we encourage you to tear that off, fill it out, leave it on the pew. That lets us know that you were here this morning. Uh, if you've got prayer requests, if you want to sign up for any of the things coming up, uh, that is the place to do that as well, so make sure you do that. A um, variety of different things coming up. Uh, first off, September 10th, uh, our women's ministry is doing a special service project for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, closer to Christmas time, we send these boxes that go out all over the world, and there's a group that's going to be making some uh, dresses out of pillowcases that will go in those boxes. And so there's some information about that. We have a special announcement about that, actually, I believe. Yes? No? no? Okay, never mind. All right, so, but check the foyer in the breezeway for that. Uh, more information on that and ways you can help out with Operation Christmas Child uh, dresses. Also, September 11th, there's a special insert in your bulletin about uh, first responders lunch that we're going to do, or a special Sunday to honor first responders that serve in our community. Uh, we're going to have a special lunch immediately after the service that day. So if you know anyone that serves as a uh, police officer, sheriff, firefighter, EMT, uh, make sure you get that information to them as well. Spread the word about that. Just a special way for us to honor those that serve our community that Sunday morning. Also coming up, uh, we have the Not So Newlywed Game, another great date night opportunity for you that will be right here in the sanctuary on September 16th. Really fun night, some great refreshments involved. You'll get to laugh at some of us that are participants in the Newlywed Game. Uh, you don't have to participate, so we just encourage you to come uh, be a part of that. It'll be a really fun date night. Uh, that Friday night, September 16th, so sign up for that in the uh, foyer as well. Also, uh, choir, we are signing up people for being part of the youth and adult choir, as well as children's choir. Great opportunity to be part of the worship ministry uh, here in some of the upcoming weeks, so get signed up for that out of the breezeway. And then last, uh, this is the time of year that we sign up uh, people for our life groups, and life group signups are going on today. There's a table out of the breezeway that has all the information on the different groups. Uh, there's some new groups that are starting off. Uh, there's a new women's study that's going to be on Sunday mornings. There's an ongoing women's study on Wednesday mornings. A new men's study that's going to be starting on Tuesday night. Uh, one group that's going to be focused on prayer and kind of outreach in the community. You can check out information about that group. Uh, as well as just a variety of other things from Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights. A lot of opportunities to get plugged in. So I encourage you to check out that table uh, and sign up for a group. That's a great way just to connect with other people in our church, great way to get into God's Word and to have fellowship with others. So I encourage you to check out the uh, tables to sign up for those groups. And uh, just again, a reminder, fill out that Connect card. Um, and also a reminder for our members and our regular attenders, our offering box uh, in the lobby is how we uh, uh, collect our offerings for the ongoing ministries of this church. And we are grateful for your contributions and your, your worship of God through those givings as well. And I'd ask you to stand. Uh, this morning as I pray for our time. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship you this morning. Uh, we thank you for the truth of your word that will that will speak truth into our lives and pray that we would be would be changed by uh, just hearing of your word this morning. I uh, pray that as we sing to you and sing your praises, that we would be the, reminded of the greatness of our God and all that you have done for us. And we pray that you would be glorified this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
at Community Bible Church. Uh, we had about 35 of our ladies go to the Beth Moore. We have a little picture of Beth Moore up there on the screen. And uh, all the ladies that went there, let's see, did y'all enjoy it? Yes, okay. Y'all learned about wisdom. Fantastic. And not only that, we had about 40 guys and gals uh, go out from our church to do some flood relief in Watson, uh, Louisiana, and also at our financial secretary's house, Barbara Thomas, at their house. 
And, uh, and let me tell you, there's, there's Stan Mongeru and, and Jacob Gamble and Devin Watson. Is, is Renata here? I, I would have sworn. Let me see. Go back that up. I would have sworn that was Renata on the left. I'm saying, Renata, you just had a baby last week. You can't be doing this. But it wasn't. It was Devin. So anyway, but they told me that uh, in the house that they worked in, there was eight feet of water all the way to the ceiling. Okay, a little quiz. What two elders are in this picture? Well, you or his husband, his wife. You know who it is. It was Danny Collins and who else? Stan. Stan Mongrew. Very good. And they were, and here's 13 hard workers in, in Watson. Got a, This is not everybody, but boy, they had a bunch of really, they, they just did a terrific job. And this is some of the work they were doing. I mean, you can just see all the junk that's having to tear all that sheetrock uh, off the wall, try to get, get rid of the mold and the mildew. And uh, here's some guys at, uh, at Tom, Barbara Thomas' house in Springfield. Uh, believe it or not, it's looking better than it did Monday. They're, these guys are just doing a great job. And here's LJ uh, at Barb's uh, house. They noticed the top, there's a big hole in that ceiling. They had a big leak. All this rain's coming. Well, they're able to fix that leak and just do a lot of work there. And there's just huge piles of stuff, you know, that they had to, had to sweep out and drag out and get out of the way. And, uh, and here we had a lot of kids involved. In fact, we had one whole family, the LeBlanc family, were all represented. There's Gracie Mann taking that wheelbarrow full of stuff, doing a great job. And, and then next big see Mom, okay, Lisa having a big old thing of plywood there. And Evan LeBlanc, I mean, he was there too, and he was, and I was talking to him between services, he said, yeah, I stepped on a nail, but it didn't go all the way through, and I got hit on the head with a metal pole, and he's a tough little guy. All right, he, he hung in there, and then last but not least, the LeBlanc family, Carter, was also in, in there, and that was fantastic. So here's a group shot of 13. This is not all the workers there, but boy, a lot of our youth group, uh, uh, Robert Schwartz got a bunch of people. Next slide is Danny Morris. Okay, this is a great story. Some of you know it. But Danny, he's in my life group, and he's always wanted to, to be able to be a first responder and go and maybe cook meals for people. So he wanted to do that, but he didn't have a very big pot, you know. So he's talking about somebody. He's like, oh, you want a pot? I got a pot. So he got brought out this huge old pot that you see there. And with that, Danny was going to be able to feed 400 people. So he cooked some pasta laya. But then Ray Maye was in Walmart or somewhere, and he's telling somebody about what we're doing. And the guy said, hey, his name is Earl somebody, and he wanted to come along too. And he said, well, okay, well, sure, you know. Well, between the two of them was cut off, our guys uh, served 1,000 meals. Unbelievable. And uh, that's why we got Whitney Billiard, and that's Danny and Stacy's daughter, and she was in there, and, and she shared with me as I was talking to her a little bit. She said, you know, we ran out. We ran out. Even with enough to feed a thousand, there's still 40, 50 cars. And she got so choked up. She said, Pastor Bill, there's some children in those cars, and we just couldn't feed them all. And she was just so touched. And, uh, and then they sent me this picture, you know, this beautiful, and here's all the, all the pots, you know, and, and underneath, if you can read that, it says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them, Matthew 18, 20. And the little caption, we fed so many people. So that was tremendous. Guys, we're going to have a lot more opportunities to help out, and uh, we, we hope that more and more of us will be able to, the job is not done. They will need our help for a long time. So, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for uh, all the workers from our church, Lord, who, was, who so willingly went and gave their time and energy uh, to help out our brothers and sisters in Christ over in Watts, Louisiana. <coughs> Father, we continue to pray for them as their lives are just completely disrupted. They're not able to live, many of them, uh, 90% of them, Lord, in that church, not able to live in their own home. So, Father, we just ask for you to continue to be their source of strength, and that you would provide for them emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, every, every kind of way. And uh, so, Father, we lift this, uh, this, the rest of this time together to you. And, Father, we thank you for your word and the richness of it. And pray, dear God, that not one of us will leave this room today without being moved by, by the picture of heaven, the glimpse of heaven that we see this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Yosemite Valley in California. We've got a beautiful picture here. Boy, have anybody ever been there, seen Yosemite Valley? It is one of the most beautiful places in all the world. And to get there, you know, you've got to drive through this long tunnel that's just carved literally right through a mountain. It's this long, dark tunnel, but at the end of it, you open up and you go to this place. You can just see this incredibly gorgeous, beautiful place. And, uh, but, but if you go through that tunnel, well, let's imagine you go through this tunnel, and what, what if all you could see would be this? Ooh, not so good. Now, that, the, the beautiful Yosemite Valley, it's there. It's still there. It hadn't changed a bit. But because of the fog, you just couldn't see it. And with all that fog blocking your view, you just couldn't admire the awe-inspiring beauty of God's creation there. You know, sometimes that happens to our view of Jesus. You know, some, sometimes our view of who Jesus really is, what Jesus is really like, sometimes it just gets kind of lost in the fog of our inaccurate presuppositions about Jesus. For instance, here's a picture of the Jesus that I grew up seeing in, in the... Um, in Sunday school, and I grew up, and we had a picture kind of like that. Jesus knocking on the door, maybe seeing that. And, and it's okay, you know, but that I'm calling Gentile Jesus, okay? Because, you, you know, he, he's got, he's, he's Gentile. He's kind of Western looking, and Jesus was Semitic. He was Jewish, you know, and, and he, I don't think he, he looked like it. Now, he certainly didn't have blue eyes like this Jesus. And he was, hair is beautifully washed, you know, and little highlights of blonde in there. I don't think the real Jesus looked much like that. I don't know. And then Jesus is often portrayed as not the Gentile Jesus, but the gentle Jesus, the mild Jesus, okay? And, and, and you know, sir, of course, that was a part of Jesus. You know, he, he was gentle and, and, and meek for sure. But, but this picture, I don't know, he kind of conveys a weak, kind of a passive guy that... Man, you don't feel like this guy could harm a fly. I don't know. The real Jesus is certainly much more than that. But even worse is what I call the effeminate Jesus. All right, notice the rouge on his cheeks and the lipstick, you know. And, and it, just, it, it just conveys the idea he's not a real strong person. He's just not a real capable person. You know, you really want to trust your life. I, I don't know. And then, of course, there is the, the suffering Jesus. And, of course, so important. I mean, we're going to talk about today. I mean, what Jesus did on the cross is just unbelievable. But, guys, he's not on the cross anymore. You know, he, he was there for six hours. And he died. And then three days later, later he triumphantly rose again. And yet some people today, he's got the holes in his hand. I mean, he, he doesn't look like he's fully resurrected to me. I don't know. I don't want to do much for me. It just, it just doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence, you know, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then some people like to envision hippie Jesus. <laughs> There's hippie Jesus. You know, and, and Matt Yorkman talks about it on this morning. He says he thinks that's California surfing Jesus. <laughs> you know, come on, the surf's up, you know. It's great. And he looks very Western, you know. It's very, you know, blue eyes and the blonde hair. He's like, all you need is love, Jesus, okay? He's a tolerant, accepting everybody's idea of how to get to heaven. It doesn't matter, just all be happy. Let's get along, Jesus. But this, too, it's a very foggy view of what the real Jesus is really all about. And really, we've kind of had some fun with these pictures, but it is so important, guys. I mean, it is so important for us to have an accurate view of Jesus. Because, you see, our perception of Jesus affects drastically our worship of Jesus. And Jesus is incredibly worthy, as you know, of the most profound worship. And that's why we've got to see him as he really is. Because when we see Jesus as he really is, we will fall down and worship him. When we see him as he really is, we will give him the praise and the honor and the glory that he so richly deserves. So this morning, as we turn to chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, we are going to get 
buckle your seatbelts. We're going to get an exquisite view of the real Jesus, how he really is. We're going to see who Jesus is. We're going to see what he is really like. And when we do, I guarantee you, we will be moved to worship that Jesus. So, why do we worship Jesus? That's basically the, the question we want to answer this morning. Why do we worship Jesus? And uh, several reasons, first of all, from this passage, because he is able to open the scroll. So if you got your Bibles, if you want to grab a little a Bible in the pew, pew rack there, follow along, last book in the Bible, chapter 5, right after 4. And uh, last week we were in chapter 4. And we saw that John was transported into heavenlies and it was just unbelievable and just, you know, just all these colors and this incredible rainbow and the living creature, all that. Same scene. This is the same exact scene. You know, so it goes, flows right from uh, Revelation 4 right into the events of Revelation 5. We're once again in the throne room of heaven. So, Revelation, flesh you. Uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, we read. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept, says John, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, to a 21st century American, this scene makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. What in the world is a scroll with seven seals? What's that all about? But let me tell you, if you were a Jew living in the first century, oh, it would make perfect sense. Oh, yeah, you know what, exactly what that is talking about. And so, that being the case, in order to understand this passage, we need to look a little bit at some historical background of what's going on here. Now, I'm going to explain, and it takes a little bit, it's kind of technical, it's a little in the tail, but please bear with me. Please bear with me, because understanding this is essential to understanding what God wants us to understand and see from this passage of Scripture. So, according to the Old Testament law, if the land or inheritance of a Jewish person was lost, a close relative, somebody in his family, a close relative, could buy it back again for that person. Uh, let's say that, that you're a, uh, a Jewish person and you had a family farm, you had a bunch of cows on it, and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden a drought comes, okay, a bad drought, no rain, all the food goes, the cows die, and you've got to sell your land just to get a little bit of money to try to buy food to, so that your family can exist. But then, you're lucky, you got a rich uncle, okay, and a relative of yours could come and he can buy back the land that you lost and restore it to you, the original owner. Now, that person who buys back the land is called in the Old Testament a kinsman redeemer. Okay? The Hebrew word for that is goel. G-O-E-L, goel. Now, if you remember when we went through Ruth about a year ago, Boaz in the book of Ruth was a kinsman redeemer. He bought back the land that Naomi's family had lost and restored it back to her. Now, here is where it gets really interesting. Okay, according to the Jewish custom, when an inheritance of land had to be forfeited because of hard times or poverty or, or whatever, a scroll was written. Okay, it had a scroll. And it was written, and on the inside of the scroll, you know, was written the reason why the inheritance of that land had to be forfeited. And on the outside of the scroll, there was writing too. And there, on the outside, was written the terms of uh, redemption of the property. What you had to do in order to get that land back. Now, this, this scroll was sealed with hot wax seven times, okay? And what they would do, just to kind of demonstrate here, you'd have a scroll and, and they'd roll out a little bit of the scroll, you know, and they'd write on that, and then after they finish, they'd seal that up and then roll that up. Actually, they roll it up and then seal it. 
And then they pull out a little bit of, whoa, we got to lose the whole thing here. Roll a little bit more. And they write on that, and then they roll that up, okay? Seal that, and they do that like seven times, okay? So, if a qualified redeemer, if he could buy back that lost property, had the means to do it, the person who had that property was obligated by law to return the land back to its original owner. But he, this guy that bought it, he had to be a qualified kinsman redeemer. And what were the necessary qualifications of a kinsman redeemer? It's this. Well, he had to be the nearest adult male blood relative. He had to be related you know, to, to this person who had lost the land. Secondly, he must be willing to assume the responsibility of a go ale. In other words, he didn't have to. You know, nobody could make him do this. It's just something, if he freely, voluntarily, if he wanted to have the goodness of his heart to do that, then, then he had to do it. He had to be willing. And then he must be able to buy back. He had to have the financial means. You know, he couldn't just go out and take the loan and says, no, you know, here's the money. I've got it. I can pay to buy this land back. Now, everybody with me so far? This is going someplace, I promise you. With that background, what is the scroll in Revelation chapter 5? Well, the scroll in Revelation 5 represents, I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to explain it, it represents the title deed to the world which was man's original inheritance from God. The title deed to the world which was man's original inheritance from God. Let me explain. When we go back to the book of Genesis, you know, it tells us when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them what? Dominion. He gave them rule over the whole earth and, and everything in it. You know, this is their, their, their world to, to cultivate and, and to bring God glory. But when Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, when he chose to just turn his back on God and rebel and disobey, say, forget you, God. I'm not listening to you. I'm going to listen to Satan. He's got a real good idea. But when he did that, he officially forfeited to Satan the authority to rule the world. Okay? The inheritance at that moment was lost. The world was lost. And from that point, all the way to the present time, Satan has had dominion, he has had rule, he has had power and sway in this world. And I'm just not making this up, guys. I mean, three times in the upper room, the night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus refers to Satan as what? As the prince of the world. Three times. The prince of the world. And let me tell you, guys, what a living hell the prince of Satan, the prince Satan has made of this earth. You know it better than I do. It's a lost world. It's a fallen world. It's a world full of cruelty and wars and, and hatred. It's a world full of sickness and famine. It is a world where death eventually destroys all life. Everything dies in this world. Everything. And so the next time you're at a funeral and you're standing before a casket which contains, contains the lifeless body of somebody that you very dearly love, don't shake your fist up at God. Be mad at Satan. Be mad at Satan. He intentionally, he maliciously tempted Adam and Eve to rebel against God. And Adam and Eve had free will and they chose to rebel, rebel against God and turn their backs on him. And because they did, death was ushered into this world. Death is not God's doing. This is Satan's doing. Next time you see a weeping mother and she's holding a, a little baby in her arms who is on the very verge of starvation, don't blame God. Blame Satan. This is his doing, not God. And the next time you watch a documentary on the Holocaust of Nazi Germany and you, and you hear and see these awful pictures about Hitler's extermination of six million Jews and you see these tortured souls in utter despair in these concentration camps, don't get angry at God over that. Don't start questioning, oh God, how could you let this happen? Be angry and say, this is the direct result. This is the consequences of him tempting Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve buying that lie, and this is the hell of this world is the result of all of that. The world is lost, guys. It had been forfeit. This is not the world God originally intended it to be. And only, only a qualified, worthy redeemer can buy back 
this lost inheritance and can restore it back to its original owners in its original glory. Only he, only that one qualified redeemer could walk up and could take the scroll, break the seven seals, and redeem our lost world. Okay. Verse 2, a mighty angel in heaven cries out, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But heaven was deathly silent. Not a word. Nobody in heaven, no angel, no, nobody on earth, no, no great person, nobody. Nobody anywhere in the universe could open that scroll. And so John just loses it. I mean, he just breaks down and begins to weep uncontrollably. After all, you know, the, the church in, in John's day was being terribly persecuted. And churches were messing up, did all kinds of stuff. He didn't know. He just didn't know what was going to happen. And he's weeping and, and, he, and he's just torn up. Dr. Criswell was a, a Baptist minister in First, First, First Baptist Church in Dallas. Boy, listen to how he eloquently explains the tears of John. John's tears represent the tears of all of God's people through all the centuries. They're the tears of Adam and Eve as they view the still form of their dead son Abel and sense the awful consequence of their disobedience. They are the tears of the children of Israel in bondage as they cry to God for deliverance from their affliction and slavery. They're the sobs and tears wrung from the heart and soul of God's people as they've stood beside the graves of loved ones and experienced the indescribable heartaches and disappointments of life. Such is the curse that sin has laid upon God's beautiful creation. No wonder. No wonder John is just overcome with tears. Because you see, if no redeemer could be found to, you know, to, uh, to remove that curse, it meant that God's creation was forever doomed to remain under the power, under the sway uh, of our deadly enemy, Satan. But then in verse 5 we read, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion, the tribe of Judah, uh, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll in its seven seals. You see, guys, there is one person. There is one person who can open that scroll and break the seals. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the one and only kinsman redeemer. He's the only person in the universe who can buy back our lost and dying world and make it all right again. So, how then is Jesus qualified? How do, how do we know he's got what it takes to, to be this kinsman redeemer? Well, uh, let's look at the reason why he's eminently qualified. Number one, he is a kinsman of mankind. Okay, He, didn't, he wasn't just staying up in heaven as God. He came down and became a man. A man. John 1.14, the Word, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling upon. He joined the ranks of humanity. Hebrews 2.14, boy, this beautifully explains it. It says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son, Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only, listen to this, only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Wow. Well, he was qualified as a kinsman, and he's also qualified to be the kinsman redeemer because he was willing to be our redeemer. Mark 10, 45, Jesus is speaking of himself as the Son of Man. And he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. A ransom for me. Kinsman Dreamer had to have the ability to pay. He had to have the funds necessary to pay the price for that land. And that price, the sacrifice necessary to, to purchase this entire world had to be a perfect sacrifice. So number three, Jesus, a uh, third qualification being without sin, he is the perfect, unblemished, sacrificial lamb. 1 Peter 1.22, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. He was perfect. But 1 John 3.5, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And in John 1.29, I love this verse. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. That's the one person, the one qualified 
kinsman redeemer who could save this world was none other than, than the Messiah. And Judah was from the tribe of King David. Uh, well, King David was from the tribe of Judah. And Judah was the tribe from which the Messiah had to come, according to Old Testament prophecy. And Jesus, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And also, he is a descendant of David. Okay? The last thing, last thing that qualifies Jesus to take the scroll and open it is because he triumphed over sin and Yes, he died on the cross, but let me tell you, he didn't stay in the grave. He rose again and just defeated sin and death. Apostle Paul puts it beautifully in 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So guys, this is the first reason why we are to worship Jesus because He and He alone is able to open that scroll. He and He alone is the only way that this sorry, lost world of ours uh, can, can be delivered. He's the only way, the only person who can relieve the stranglehold that Satan has on us and our world. Jesus is worthy to be praised and worshipped, guys. But that's just the first reason. There's another reason why we worship Jesus, and that is because He is fully God. Fully God. Now, at this point, this is so dramatic, at this point, a fascinating thing happens. Because, see, John has been weeping and weeping, and one of the 24 elders comes over to encourage him, and John is looking at the elder, and he's telling him and listening to him. And when John hears from this elder that the mighty Messiah will open the scroll is going to be there, he turns to look for himself, fully expecting the Lion of Judah, a big, powerful, roaring lion. But instead, what does he see? Verse 6, then I saw a lamb. And the Greek word is the diminutive form. It looks like a little lamb, a, a, a pet lamb almost. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, guys, when we get to heaven, Jesus is not going to look like that, okay? I just want to tell you, he's not going to look like a lamb. He's not going to look like seven eyes and, and all to horns and all. No, this is a picture, a symbolic representation of who Jesus really is. And he, he really is, is the Lamb of God. And this lamb, he's looking like he's slain. And the word for slain there, uh, it means violently slain. It means a mortal, it means slaughtered, okay? And so you can see the mortal wounds on uh, uh, this little lamb. And yet he's standing, which means he is fully, 100%, completely alive. And amazingly, he's standing in the center of the throne. And this, of course, clearly indicates that this lamb is fully God. Because only God can stand in the center of the throne. Last, last week in chapter 4, God the Father was sitting, standing in the, in the center of the throne. And now His Son, Jesus, said, they are both equally, fully God. Now, He has seven horns. Horns here and throughout uh, the rest of Revelation, it stands for strength. It stands for power. Seven is the number of perfection. So having seven horns, it represents, it symbolifies, symbolizes, it, it signifies the complete, perfect, almighty power of the Lamb. Power that's, which is just unequal anywhere. And he has seven eyes. Well, seven, you know, again, uh, represents perfection. The eyes is talking about the immense wisdom. He is all-knowing. He's all-seeing. He's omniscient. Lamb. All of this in a little bitty lamb. Amazing. This lamb is the lamb of God. This is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. This, folks, it is Jesus. And yes, it's true. When Jesus came to earth the first time, he came like a lamb. Okay? He, he, he was meek and very vulnerable. He was the suffering servant that Isaiah 53 prophesies. And, and he, he, he absolutely allowed himself to be taken and arrested and whipped and flogged and crucified so that he could pay for your sins and mine. But guys, 
That's all true, but we need to realize that this same lamb that was slain, and we sang about him this morning, standing in the center of the throne of God, he is fully, 100% God. And guys, this is so important for us to understand because, you know, a lot of times a day people want to just kind of emphasize the earthly life of Jesus. You know, we've got a lot of poems, we've got a lot of songs that glamorize, you know, the gentle carpenter or the humble teacher. But guys, so often they fail to exalt the glorified, risen Lord <laughs> Jesus Christ. And that is who we're worshiping, guys. Church, we need to understand that we are not worshiping a baby in a manger. We are not worshiping a dead corpse on a cross. We worship Jesus, the Lamb of God, who stands in the center of the throne. Jesus, the Almighty, the All-Powerful, the All-Seeing, the All-Knowing God. This is the Jesus, guys, that we bow down to. This is the Jesus that we honor and we worship and we glorify and we adore. And to see Jesus as anything less than that is heresy. It's heresy. We worship Jesus only because he is fully God. If he is half God, kind of God, good teacher, we wouldn't worship him. But because he's fully God, yes, we bow down. We worship him. Okay, verse 7, 8, the worship begins. Verse 7, this is one of the, mark it in your Bible, one of the most climactic acts in all of Unbelievable. Listen to how John MacArthur comments on the significance of what happened. Everything John has been describing since the vision began in chapter 4, verse 1, had been building towards this moment. This views the great culminating act of history, the act that will signal the end of rebellious man's day. The ultimate goal of redemption is about to be seen. Paradise will be regained. Eden is going to be restored. Before John's wondering eyes, the Lamb came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. The worthy one has arrived to take back what is rightfully his. Third reason. Third reason to worship Jesus. As soon as Jesus takes that scroll in his hand, boy, all of heaven just falls prostrate on the ground and worships the Lord Jesus. Verse 9, then they all begin to sing. They, they, they begin to sing to Jesus. They say, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men from God, for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. Third reason then why we're to worship Jesus is because His blood, His blood, paid the purchase price of all of our sins. Jesus was qualified, guys. He was able to buy back lost humanity who were living in this lost world because of the blood which Jesus Christ shed hanging on that cross. That cross. That is the purchase price, guys. And nothing else would do. That's the only for Nothing more, nothing less. The price of our salvation, the price of our redemption, it's not our own goodness if we happen to be a little bit better than somebody else. It's not, it has anything to do with anything we've ever done good or bad, anything we ever will do good or bad. Nothing to do with that. It's not being moral. It, it's, it's not going to church. It's not doing religious, per, religious things, you know. The price of our salvation is the precious blood of the Lamb. It. That's it. Peter beautifully writes about it. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know, Peter writes, that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. All right, there's our redeemed word. From the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But, listen to this, with the precious blood of Christ, what? A lamb without blemish or defect. Then, Boy, this thing just crescendos. It just keeps building and building. Verse 11, the angels, they join in singing in this incredible burst of praise. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircle the throne and the living creatures and, and the elders. Now let's stop a minute. It's all to think about ten thousand times ten thousand. You know how many angels that we're talking about? hundred million a hundred million angels are loudly singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So we also worship Jesus because of what He is worthy to receive. 
He's worthy. Let's just go through them real briefly here. He's worthy to receive power. Think about it. Jesus in his first coming, he was born in weakness and as a helpless six-pound little baby. And he died in weakness as he allowed himself to be crucified on that cross. But now he is the recipient of all power. There is no power even close to him. He is worthy to receive wealth. And becoming, uh, coming to earth, he made himself poor, reducing himself from, from, from God in heaven down to the God on earth in the flesh of a man. And, and yet now he owns all the riches of heaven and earth. He's worthy to receive wisdom. On earth, men laughed at him. Men ridiculed him. They called him a fool. And yet he is the very wisdom of God. He's worthy to receive strength in becoming a man. Jesus shared in, in the weakness of humanity. He is able to be hungry. He is able to be tired. He is able to be thirsty. But now he possesses all. All strength and power. He's worthy to receive honor and glory and praise. On earth, that wasn't the case. Jesus experienced incredible humiliation, incredible shame as evil men mocked him and ridiculed and reviled him. But all that has changed. Now he receives nothing but honor and praise and glory. Now I'd like you to just stop for a minute and, and imagine I want, the first thing I want to imagine is that you're a football fan. And some of you are. I want you to imagine you are a dot man. You are, but you bleed football, okay? Nikki said, well, I can see you, 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 you're a football fan. Okay. Okay. So let's imagine that you are at a crucially important football game. And it's the fourth quarter. And your team is behind by five points. And man, the clock is just ticking away. Time's running out. And you've just got this feeling in the pit of your stomach that your team, man, is just not going to be able to pull off a win. And then you, well, there's three minutes left to play. The other team is marching down the field. It's like a score again. And then your team intercepts. And your guy runs it back to the opposing team's 40-yard line. And then a few plays later, you're down to the two-yard line. And there's only two seconds left on the clock. And there's just time for one more play. And as the quarterback gets ready to take the snap, I mean, you can hardly breathe. Hike! And the running back gives it to him. He goes right up the gut. And there's this tremendous surge of the offensive line. And they meet this huge wall of these giant players. And you're just, don't, you can't see, you don't know if he's going to make it or not. And then all of a sudden, your guy, he's still got the ball. He makes one more surge. And he goes over the, into the end zone. Touchdown! The game's over. Your team wins. And you and the hometown fans go berserk. And you're cheering wildly. You're hugging completely strangers and you're jumping up and down and it's just unbelievable. What an awesome ending to a hard fought battle. Now, take all that cheering and celebration going on at the end of that game and multiply it by about a thousand times and you might have a little inkling of the kind of celebration that is set off in heaven when Jesus, the lamb that was slain, walks up to his heavenly father takes the scroll from his hand, breaks those seals, and opens it. You see, for thousands of years, God, Satan has had his way. He, he's been marching down the field of this world, and, and over the century, he's brought more pain, and more suffering, and more misery to more people than we can even imagine. And ever since the garden, he has cunningly, brilliantly lied and deceived to get people to turn away and rebel against God. And he and his minions have, have just horribly polluted God's paradise. And every day, every day, when there, there are murders that take place all over the world, and rapes and broken families, and people are hopelessly addicted to drugs and to pornography and to alcohol and sexual immorality and all kinds of addictions, families are falling apart. Countries go to war. Hundreds of thousands of little children go to sleep every night hungry, not knowing if they're going to be able to eat the next day. And we've got corrupt politicians. We've got jails full of criminals. We've got pedophiles that prey on vulnerable little children. Our world, guys, our world is full of poverty and sickness and crippling diseases. And people are just filled with anger and with rage and with hatred and with prejudice and utter selfishness. And guys, things aren't getting any 
any better. They seem to be getting worse. There never seems to be an end of it. Satan seems to have the upper hand. Is there any hope? Yes. Look, is there any hope for our world? But then in heaven, Jesus walks over to his father in the center of the throne and he grabs that scroll. And when he does, heaven just erupts with a deafening roar of cheering and tears of joy and hugs and jumping up and down in tremendous celebration. Why? Because the Lamb wins. Satan's time has run out. It is over. The game is over. Jesus is a death on that cross. He came to purchase Christ. He came to rest of the Lord's sin. And now, guys, he's coming back. He's coming back and getting ready to defeat and obliterate every ounce of evil and wickedness in this whole planet. He's coming back. He's coming back to take back the land that the enemy has stolen. And he's coming back to set up his millennial kingdom where he himself will be in charge and everything is going to be over. At last, guys, at last, at last, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That will be a reality. Then in verse 13, the whole universe joins in the celebration. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praised and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen! And the elders fell down and worshipped. Guys, that's the real Jesus. That's what he's really like. And that's the Jesus that, guys, we need to fall down ourselves and worship. Worship and worship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for this stunning scene that we have in heaven. And Father, it just gives us hope. And when we look around and just see how bad things are, well, we know that it's not going to be that way forever. That you're coming back. That you're going to grab that scroll and, and you're coming down and you're going to judge all the sin and evil and wickedness. And you're going to come and be our king our ruler, our Messiah. Thank you for that, Father. And help us as your representatives here on earth to spread this message. Help us, Lord, to, to, to tell everybody we know, our family, our friends, our people at work, that the only hope of this world is your son, Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. And Father, I just pray that there's, there's some people here this morning who you're hearing all this, would just love one day themselves to be up in heaven and to witness this very thing taking place. God, I pray that, that if they don't know you, they can come to know you right now, today. Lord, I just pray that there's somebody that, that maybe goes to church, maybe is religious, maybe kind of goes through the motions, but realize, realize you're kind of empty. Realize that they've still got a hole in their heart that, that nothing else seems to be able to fill. Lord, I pray for that person that you might just gently move him or her to just stop and talk to you, Lord. And just say to you, God, I want to go to heaven one day. And I want to see this victorious thing that's going to happen. God, I want to be on your side. But Lord, I know that, that my sin, no matter how few sins I have or how many sins, that any sin, Lord, of mine separates me from you. But Lord, I see, I, I understand that your son Jesus, that his blood that was shed on that cross can completely cover my sins and turn my sins uh, into just white as snow. So Father, I believe this. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, fully God. And I believe that his death did pay for all of my sins. And so, Father, right now, I just want to accept you. I want to receive this free gift of salvation. I want to have you in my life, Jesus, now and until the end of eternity. So come into my life, Father. So, Father, we just thank you for, for again, for this, this word from, from Revelation 5. Help it to change us. Help, us to, help it to help us to have a, a new perspective on just how we live life and what's important and what's not. And we pray it, Father, in the blessed Son of the kinsman redeemer, our precious Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if we can all stand and sing the, the last song. And
and uh, Jordy's going to sing, and, and listen, have the elders come forward, and uh, we would love to pray for you. Hey, listen, again, if you prayed that prayer, please write a book on your connect card. We'd like to get in touch with you and just kind of help you in some of those first important steps as a new believer. So thanks for coming this morning. I'll see you next God, we just ask, Lord, that you lead us and guide us this week and help us to praise you and worship you in every area of our life, God. We pray.